Good evening, everybody. Uh, okay, I don't have any slide. Okay, here. <laughs> yeah. So it's a really great pleasure for me to be here because that um, you might have heard from Dr. So about uh, this conference, and uh, uh, we learned uh, this course from uh, the American Heart Association at the time. The World uh, Federation of Cardiology organized a similar meeting, which was called the Six Day Symposium. And uh, Dr. So and I attended. And uh, on the way back to here, to the back to home, Dr. So and uh, I discussed uh, how to organize similar meeting in Korea. And that is the uh, beginning of this course. And then I, it's exactly 20 years ago they, when Dr. So and I attended the American Heart Association and World Federation uh, the meeting. So it is especially the I'm honored to be back. And then also that uh, I worked here uh, four years uh, in the Sejong Heart Institute in the beginning of my career. And then most of the uh, basis of my learning about congenital heart disease is from Sejong Heart Institute. Okay. So the topic I was given is that MRI assessment of repair tetralogy of follow. The handout has a little bit more slides than uh, I want to talk about because 20 minutes is not good enough to cover everything. So I just uh, reduced the slide number a little bit. So the we all know that uh, the <coughs> after TOF repair, you have a lot of problems. When uh, the I worked here in uh, 1985 to 1989, 89, at the time, <laughs> episode is that uh, usually cardiac surgeons come out of the uh, the operation room, usually stop in the uh, radiology uh, reading room, and then used to say, "Oh, June, the we made the right ventricle out for track as large as possible." There is a very very triumphant the the statement. At the time, that uh, we didn't know that uh, they will make us the problem in 10, 20 years. So anyway, pulmonary regurgitation is an inevitable consequence of TOF repair. Residual obstruction is not uncommon. And then a residual ventricular septal defect or atrial septal defect, the it's just the infrequent C. And right bundle branch block is very common. So as a consequence that the right ventricle dilates and hypertrophied and right ventricle and left ventricle becomes dysfunctional and eventually systolic and diastolic failure. And then exercise intolerance, the major problem is arrhythmia. Uh, especially sustained eight, the uh, ventricular tachycardia causing sudden death. The incidence is the one in 700 uh, per year in adult population. So because of that, we need to uh, do some uh, regular imaging that should include uh, the purpose is that uh, the risk stratification of for major complications and then optimum timing for surgery or intervention. And then after that, the second, uh, the third stage, uh, third time surgery, and then follow up uh, is also important. So we need to know the pulmonary regurgitation in terms of volume and fraction and ventricular volumes, myocardial mass and function. And myocardial tissue characterization is uh, a rather recent concept, but uh, appears very important. And residual obstruction in terms of anatomy and the flow should be assessed. And then residual VSD or ASD, which can calculate the QPQS. And aortic valve function and aortic root size is a problem uh, eventually uh, later in life. And then also that uh, if you do second time surgery or uh, interventional procedure, it is worthwhile to know the proximal coronary artery courses. Okay. So in that regard, cardiovascular MRI is the regarded now is it the unanimously regarded as a gold standard because that using the CNA imaging, you have anatomy and function and ventricular volumes. And then phase contrast imaging is a great tool to assess the uh, blood flow the volumes. In terms of blood flow volume, this is the only existing direct tool to accurately measure the blood flow. So that's why that the MRI is so important. And then anatomy, and then a late gadolinium enhancement regarding uh, the kind of uh, uh, myocardial damage. 
Okay. So recently, we begin to do uh, following examination, which is the uh, called the ECG gated and respiration navigated 3D uh, gradient echo technique. This is one of the MRI technique using intravascular contrast agent. What we used to use is that basically uh, the the extracellular contrast medium. Therefore, the for angiographic imaging, we want to do uh, first the, f the pass. However, this agent is intravascular. The, com the binds to albumin and stays within the blood vessel for three, four hours. So we have a lot of time to uh, deal with imaging. So therefore, the frozen imaging is possible. This is uh, targeted in systole. This is targeted in diastole. The anatomy is all there. So although that it takes about uh, seven, ten minutes to acquire such images, the you don't have to worry about anything. So you have your full anatomy ready to show. Therefore, it is the uh, the uh, the uh, the contrast medium appears a little bit expensive, but if you think about your time, re the the information you have for five to ten minutes, it is really a lot. So therefore, it is reasonably cost effective. So from there, that uh, you can do 3D reconstruction, and then for the interventional procedure, we make the models for the um, uh, the, the our interventionist to test whether uh, the uh, these models really fit into the um, uh, uh, the uh, the right ventricle outflow track in and systole and, and diastole very nicely. So we have a much less the the concern about uh, the inadequate size of the uh, the stent in the right ventricle outflow tract. Okay, so this is uh, how we do the MRI. So the uh, the, the the what I want to do today is that uh, the just I want to introduce the, the uh, how we do for the TOF population and what kind of uh, uh, cardiovascular MRI parameters we generate. And also that I want to talk about a little bit of controversial topics, which means that what is restrictive physiology, which is very, very popular topic. Is it the, uh, the really bad or good? And then which cardiovascular MRI parameters are the best predictors of the patient's outcome? And then more importantly, which uh, cardiovascular parameter, the MR parameters, should be used for timing of surgery or interventions? And then uh, summarize the, uh, what I was talking about. Okay. So this is our protocol. The, the first thing is that uh, ECG gate is static so-called SSFP, or is the, uh, the MRI technology imaging, in three orthogonal planes. If we have those images, actually uh, overview of the cardiovascular system is done in almost two minutes. And then CNA imaging for anatomy and function uh, using two chamber plane of the right and left ventricles and four chamber plane and right ventricle outflow tract plane and left ventricle outflow tract and then short axis for the ventricle volumes and myocardial mass. And then uh, for the blood flow assessment using so-called phase contrast imaging, we target the main pulmonary artery, right and left pulmonary arteries, and ascending aorta and superior vena cava, and descending aorta and inferior vena cava, and atrioventricular valves. And then for the tissue characterization, we do late gadolinium enhancement study uh, in axial and short axis planes. This is a rather new sequence, which is called a T1 mapping. Uh, I find that handheld, it is a, the, the TA is not is type of T1 mapping. Uh, the looking at the uh, uh, volume of extracellular space, which uh, correlates with the degree and the severity of fibrosis. And then, uh, the, as I showed, that ECG-gated respiration navigated 3D angio with intravascular contrast agent. So this is the, uh, the, what we see in the pulmonary station in Cine. So this is the valve area. You have a little bit of stenosis. So therefore, there is a flow acceleration shown as bright signal here in this region above the valve level. And then during diastole, you can see that the uh, high signal coming back. That's the regurgitation here too. You can see if you have uh, two uh, views like this, you uh, know the uh, uh, ventricular outflow tract anatomy, and then uh, rough estimate of your severity of pulmonary regurgitation. 
So the primary regurgitation, as a matter of fact, is very important. So this is a very recent paper from uh, the Great Ormond Street uh, Children's Hospital in London. And the, they looked at the, uh, their surgical results. So this is a zero step at the time of surgery. And then uh, immediately after uh, the surgery, there is a little bit of attrition because of uh, the post-surgical death, that is a little bit too much, but uh, probably is a long time ago. So, and then uh, gradually a uh, small number of people uh, really dies. And then uh, the, the this is the, uh, the number of people who requires pulmonary valve replacement. So the middle is that alive without pulmonary valve replacement. So if you look at the number at the age of uh, the 20 years after surgery, about 30% they, uh, they require pulmonary valve replacement or died. Okay, and then the 40 years later, about half will need the, the, the intervention. So that's why this is a really significant mobility and then uh, requirement of uh, uh, the uh, s surgery or intervention. So therefore, pulmonary regurgitation is a major problem. So I want to focus major in the, the in my talk on the pulmonary regurgitation. Anyway, so this is the pulmonary valve. This is the right ventricle. This is a pulmonary artery. And then determinants for pulmonary regurgitation primarily uh, from original valve annulus size and surgical procedure undertaken and the right ventricle outflow morphology and size. However, also important is that the uh, distal afterload side and uh, what is the pulmonary vascular resistance is, whether there is any pulmonary artery stenosis. And then uh, also the pulmonary artery needs to have a certain compliance to uh, the have the pulmonary blood flow appropriate. In addition, uh, pulmonary regurgitation uh, the will change according to the myocardial relaxation property and myocardial compliance. And then also the time uh, the right ventricle provides for the uh, diastolic filling. So the how we quantify with them all, just uh, looking at the, uh, this one, main pulmonary artery in axial view and the sagittal view, we make the cross section. And then you can see that here, it comes with the anatomical imaging and the flow image. Flow image appears very, very uh, dirty looking, but however, it has a lot of information. So what you have is that white is a forward flow, black is retrograde flow, and then uh, the importance is that here, the the signal is the cross the across the whole cross sectional area, which means that in echocardiography you have a little bit of your sample here, therefore you don't know the whole scenario of blood flow across the vessel. However, in MRI, you have a pixel by pixel, you have flow velocity information, and you know the area, therefore, you have a very, very accurate calculation of the blood flow volume. So it is not uh, emphasizing uh, the ex exaggerating. So this is the only existing tool you can reliably measure the blood flow volume. So the from there that uh, we have your uh, blood flow volume curve, this is a systolic forward flow and this is diastolic retrograde flow. So we calculate the uh, blood flow volume uh, during diastole the and then also uh, regression to fraction from there. Okay. So this is the correlation between uh, pulmonary uh, regurgitant volume and the pulmonary regurgitant fraction. As you can see, there is a very good correlation. However, there is a little bit of scatter out. So which means that uh, the pulmonary the regurgitant fraction and the volumes are not completely matching to each other because that uh, PR volume and the, the especially uh, is uh, heavily affected by the uh, ventricular systolic volume, t the systolic function too. But anyway, from this curve, uh, we have uh, uh, criteria, our own criteria. So the in terms of primary regression to fraction, 20% and the primary uh, regression to volume, one liter per minute per square meter of body surface area, this area we uh, they call mild and primary station between 20 to 40 percent and 1 to 2.5 liter we call moderate and above that we call severe okay 
So uh, the, uh, it is worthwhile to look at the pulmonary regurgitation in a different way. So you can see that in this case, pulmonary regurgitation is throughout the diastolic phase. However, here, pulmonary regurgitation is quite a short period of time. So the, however, one should really, uh, really understand that this is really the mildest form of pulmonary regurgitation. The more pulmonary regurgitation, the shorter the tend to, not always, tend to have a shorter regurgitant, to the, uh, regurgitant period the, during diastole. Why, that? Why is that? So here you can see in the a little bit more than mild, you have the early period, the, the larger amount. Right ventricle is a failing, failing, and right ventricle doesn't want to take any more, gradually decreasing. And then if your regurgitation is more severe, and then that here, it kind of restrictive physiology the starts earlier and then end the diastole you have here uh, the integrated flow here. I will go over that here later in my talk. And then even if uh, it is severe, the actually feeling of uh, the pulmonary regurgitation it is a fraction of diastole. However, this is a more severe form of regurgitation than this. So this is actually very similar to what echocardiography experienced. Is, so this is a paper published in 2004. And then uh, they looked at the PR index. What, is, what it is is that duration of PR, which is this, divided by, by duration of diastole. And there is a close relationship with PR fraction SCMR. And then uh, what it is is that PR index less than 0 0.77, which means that this is shorter. There is 100% sensitivity and 85% specificity for PR fraction over 25%. 24.5%. So in echocardiography, I think uh, you use that too. So if you see that the PR duration is shorter, and then you are thinking more severe form of pulmonary regurgitation. That's the kind of paradox, but that is true. But however, the, uh, it is worthwhile to uh, think why it is. But the, uh, the I will talk about it the one more time later. So in terms of uh, pulmonary regurgitation, so this uh, black is the regurgitation from the main in the main pulmonary artery. So red is uh, from the right pulmonary artery, and the blue is from the left pulmonary artery. In the very classic case, in that classic case, the theoretically should be like this. So PR between the uh, the right and left pulmonary artery forward even distribution retrograde even distribution. However, more often you have this. So this is a pulmonary regurgitation in the right pulmonary artery. This is a pulmonary regurgitation in the left pulmonary artery. What is different is that ejection time for the right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery is already different. And pulmonary regurgitation in the left pulmonary artery starts earlier and then higher grade than the right pulmonary artery. So this is the uh, usual case. So we looked at uh, when Dr. Isa Kang was with us for a year in 2002, we looked at the uh, other cases. And this is the pulmonary regurgitation from the right pulmonary artery. This is the pulmonary regurgitation from the left pulmonary artery. You can see most of the cases, regurgitation from the left pulmonary artery is significantly higher than the regurgitation from the right pulmonary artery which is a very important observation. So why is it important? So this is an example. This is a post-op TOF with absent pulmonary valve. Main pulmonary artery is still humongous, and right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery are a little bit larger than the right pulmonary artery. However, when you measure the blood flow, this is the case. Right pulmonary artery, there is no regurgitation at all. However, left pulmonary artery, systolic ejection time is shorter, and there is severe regurgitation. So eventually, the blood flow distribution is 96% to the right pulmonary artery, only 4% to the left pulmonary artery. So this is the extreme case. In this case, what it means is that asymmetric blood flow in the lungs is very, very common. is due more to differential pulmonary regurgitation than to differential forward flow. And then there is a 
poor correlation between the net fold flow and cross-sectional area in branch pulmonary arteries. So we, the, before we have these physiologic studies, we used to the, the, um, uh, look at the pulmonary arteries by size, Nakara index and the, uh, what is the other the index, the uh, Makun index, the type of things. So, but however, that can uh, the be very, very misleading if you don't know the blood flow. That's why that blood flow assessment is important. Moving on to the ventricular volumes and functions, because the pulmonary regurgitation gives the, uh, the vent right ventricular volume overload, the uh, volume measurement is important. We usually use the short axis plane to uh, measure the end systolic and end diastolic volume, and then we give the um, end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, and then ejection fraction, and if uh, required, myocardial mass. Okay, so. Uh, this is the um, uh, the the uh, the pulmonary regurgitant fraction and the, the right ventricle and the diastolic uh, volume index. As expected, if you have a higher pulmonary regurgitant fraction, you have a higher end diastolic volume. However, you should be careful in looking at this correlation. So R square is only 0 0.3, and in Boston study, their R square is the 0 0.6. However, the, uh, this scatter is too wide to say that uh, really they are really closely uh, related. So they are related, but there are many, many other factors to uh, the, uh, the to have this relationship really off the, uh, the um, what is expected. Okay. But anyway, based on that, the remember that the PR fraction 0 to 20 percent is mild and 20 to 40 percent is, is moderate and above that is severe. And that uh, the, uh, the area, the right ventricular volume is equivalent to 130 and then uh, the uh, 40 percent is 170. The, you might remember that the uh, surgical indication for uh, pulmonary regurgitation, uh, one of the recommendation is 170 and there is 180, 160 type of things. That is the, the exactly this number. So, so this is a Boston data, very the similar. If you go to 20, 40 percent, that is 120, 160. So very similar the number. So you, you can the, just remember 160 to 170, if, we, if it is above that, it is a really severe dilatation. So in terms of systolic function, we define the right ventricle ejection fraction as a borderline if it is a 45 to 50 percent and mildly reduced if, if between 35 to 45 percent and uh, moderately reduced when it is 25 to 35 percent and severely reduced if it is less than 25 percent. So as expected, the, uh, the, the left ventricle ejection fraction and right ventricle ejection fraction correlates reasonably well, although that there is some scatter as well. So this is a Boston data. This is, uh, I don't remember the institute. It's another US institution. Look at the three institutions, how similar the, the uh, really scatters are. So which means that it is a real story. So in terms of systolic function, we need to think about this. The, uh, this is a global, uh, uh, the, the you we, we can talk about the right ventricle as a global thing. But however, this area, you can see that the right ventricle outflow tract does not contract, which means that uh, the, this is the surgically damaged part of the right